Hi, this is Daniel Strauss from Talking Points Memo here with my partner in crime, Betsy Woodruff, uh, for I think it's our third official installment of uh, Woodruff and Strauss. And uh, we realize we haven't really even explained what this show is. Betsy, what is this show? I'm so glad you asked. I <laughs> thought you'd never ask. Woodruff? It's almost like we talked about... <laughs> Describing this show beforehand. Weird. What a what a wonderful coincidence. How fortuitous. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you might recall, Daniel, uh, the two of us have been having uh, scintillating conversations about electoral politics over blogging heads for a number of months now, and it's been really really fun and a good time. And thanks to the delightful folks who run blogging heads, this is now a regular feature. On their website, if you look over to the left side of your computer screen, you'll see a neat little button that says Woodruff and Strauss. That is obviously referring to this Woodruff and to Daniel as the Strauss. And a couple times a month, at least two, maybe maybe three, maybe even more, we'll be doing episodes talking about particularly national electoral politics, how electoral politics affect campaigns in D.C., and then sometimes other things depending on what what fits our fancy, and also we're going to be having guests on, which is really exciting. So I had Sahil Kapoor, who's a good friend, come last time, and we talked a lot about specific Senate races and what he thought a Republican Senate would do, which is really interesting, getting his perspective on that. And Daniel is going to have, Daniel, you are going to have our next guest I won't spoil the surprise on that, uh, unless you want to give a teaser trailer, which... Huge. Huge. Big deal. Yeah, by the way, one thing, like, I'm always... When I I think about the roster, I'm always thinking about Washington Examiner people that I'd like to bring Go for it. Uh, There's so many awesome examiner people. Yeah, we're going to have more. We're going to have more of them again. Cool. Um, Mm -hmm. I think we definitely will. Yeah. I mean, there's... we, We could... Given the parameters for this, we could probably do three hours of content every single day. Unfortunately, probably. unfortunately, I don't know if my editor would be super excited about that. But uh, yeah, so what if from Strauss? It's a show. It's going to be fun. It has been fun thus far. And yeah, I'm looking forward to watching your conversations with people and sort of reconning the two of us. So hooray, woohoo. <laughs> Well done, Betsy. <laughs> now we all know what we're doing here. Good. So I guess the first thing okay. the first thing to talk about today is Do you want to take it away, Daniel? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, the first thing we wanted to talk about today was there was a New York Times piece uh, basically looking at I think it was by Jonathan Martin. Um, mm-hmm. but uh, basically saying that sort of the advantage in the culture war, culture war has flipped, and now Democrats are using social issues to bash Republicans. Uh, and this story cited uh, the contraception debate going on and on over-the-counter contraception, Republicans uh, shifting to supporting over-the-counter contraception, um, and Democrats, uh, that partially being a response to Democrats labeling Republicans as extreme on those issues. But also, this applies to gay marriage, uh, where we've seen some movement on that. And I guess you could say, arguably, immigration. Uh, but I'm on the fence about whether or not immigration is part of the culture wars. Um, yeah, and, and I'm not sure um, he brought immigration into the article. I think, it's an, I think yeah, immigration is interesting because I think it's weird not to refer... Well... I think the way we talk about most issues in national politics, we kind of have a binary. We have social issues, and then we have fiscal issues, right? And then there's also foreign policy, which is kind of its own thing. Uh, And I feel like typically when we talk about these things, we talk about issues that affect, you know, that that have a moral component, you know, that that people decide how to vote based on what their personal moral beliefs are, abortion, gay marriage, are the two classic examples. And then we also talk about issues that have a pocketbook component. And I think we tend to talk about these things like they're totally separate and like there's not any overlap. For instance, as if abortion doesn't have a financial element or as if raising the minimum wage couldn't be a moral issue at all. Uh, When, of course, the reality for a lot of voters is 
often much more complicated. And I think that we see how complicated that reality is when the immigration debate comes up because it really kind of messes up that entire binary system because it is obviously a financial issue. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge financial issue for companies. It's a huge financial issue for American workers. It's a huge financial issue for the immigrants who live here. But it obviously also has moral components. Um, and people on both sides of the debate have very strong moral reasons for believing what they believe. So I don't, I don't, I, I think it makes the culture wars conversation more difficult, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> But, uh... Right. I mean, I mean, I, the thing is about, like, I don't know. I I was a little... I'm a little skeptical to say Democrats have won the culture war, uh, which is sort of how I saw this article sold as, yeah. um, because Democrats are very much not going to win the House of Representatives, and... Uh, they could lose the Senate at the same time, so perhaps they have, I mean, I think you could say they've shifted, uh, you know, the debate has sort of shifted in that mm-hmm. way, but at the same time, um, lately I've done some reporting on over-the-counter contraception, and the thing about it is that a lot of, I mean, Democrats at first were taken kind of aback by guys like Tom Tillis, the Senate, the Senate, the GOP Senate nominee in North Carolina, or Cory Gardner, the GOP Senate nominee in uh, Colorado, um, announcing their support for uh, over-the-counter contraception. But after that, they sort of uh, Democrats found a new thing to criticize on them on this issue, which is that uh, they felt that it needed to be part of a broader shift on. Um, on contraception and women's health in general, Mm -hmm. and that's how they disagree with it. And it doesn't look like Republicans are moving in that way, so maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm taking this as, maybe, I mean, you, if you're a candidate, you always need something to criticize your opponents about. But, uh, it doesn't seem like there has, I don't know how much of a shift there has been on this issue. I think there is definitely movement away from, uh, conservatives or I or not maybe not conservatives but uh, Republicans pushing um, uh, you being on the attack and saying you know X candidate is for abortion therefore he's for killing babies right. in the same way yeah. that we would have seen a few cycles ago but I don't know how like I don't know how deep this change is and this cultural shift is. On the same, on the other hand, though, gay marriage is not what it used to right. be, right? Yeah. It's not a controversial issue. For I that. think, and there are a number of candidates out there, like uh, Monica okay. Webby, who recently came out for in support of gay mm-hmm. marriage. Now, granted, she's the Republican nominee for Senate in Oregon, uh, and she's uh, trailing Senator Jeff Merkley there, but at the same time. I think it depends on a. It's it's on a case by case basis. Yeah, right? sure thing. I think when we talk, I think it's kind of a question of what we talk about when we talk about the culture wars, and maybe. Mm-hmm. So I think typically culture wars is a shorthand way of talking about gay marriage and abortion as two essential political issues, You're two of the biggest, most divisive political questions of the last twenty years, maybe twenty years, maybe more. Although even gay marriage wasn't even that much of a question uh, in 1994, right. which is just crazy to think about. But if we talk about it in those terms, and we say culture wars, then we're looking at disagreements over, I think, primarily abortion and gay marriage, but then also disagreements over whether or not schools can teach evolution. You know, textbook Texas textbook controversies, controversies, disagreements mm-hmm. over abstinence-only sex education, stuff that you know, arguments that were much more central to the, the national conversation, which is the worst phrase of all time, during the Bush administration than they were during the Obama administration. And right. and I think I think the the conservative side of the culture wars or the conservative Christian side of the culture wars sort of had its biggest wins during the Bush administration. And Democrats were very much on defense 
whenever they were talking about gay marriage, whenever they were talking about abortion, you know, even talking about absence only sex education, you see candidates and national political leaders really just kind of argle bargling their way through any sort of conversation on abortion. It was just Democrats were yeah. great at talking about it. Um, and it was an issue Republicans could win on, and it was an issue that was an essential one for Republicans. And it still is today. You know, you with a few exceptions, you know, notable exceptions, you can't be a Republican candidate for a statewide federal office if you're pro choice. Uh, it's possible. Bruce Rauner in Illinois, Scott Brown is not as pro life as many on the right would like him to be. But generally speaking, the abortion side, you know, the the pro life position still dominates the Republican Party. But I think talking about the culture wars and how and how our conversation about the culture wars has changed, I think I think the most the most important element is talking about gay marriage. Uh, and this is something that Jonathan mm-hmm. Martin's New York Times article touched on a little bit. Um, but in 2004, Karl Rove and George W. Bush made that election campaign about gay marriage because that was the winning issue. Because if they talked about Iraq, they were going to lose. Isn't that crazy to think that just 10 years ago – you could win Ohio and Florida by being against gay marriage. And now it's, it's practically a non-starter. Our Republicans are yeah. in retreat on that issue. Um, and that's a huge area where Democrats have won, just enormously, and especially where they won up among young people. Uh, you know, millennials, whoop de doo are, are almost entirely uh, supportive of gay marriage. Um, abortion yeah. is trickier because we haven't seen the public opinion shift in a really dramatic way that we saw with gay marriage. Uh, depending on what polling you look at, you know, Gallup's done a lot of polling on this. A lot of young people have opinions on abortion that tend to be more conservative. They might think it's morally wrong. Uh, they might be okay with Roe v. Wade, but also okay with, with regulations on abortion clinics. Uh, they might identify as pro-life. They're, pro-life. They're much more likely to, to identify as pro-life than they are to identify as anti-gay marriage. Um, and that's an area where Republicans have really held their ground. But I think if the big picture question is, are Republicans or Democrats more on defense about culture war issues, using that as a synonym for abortion and gay marriage? I think the answer without a doubt is that Republicans are more on defense. Republicans have a really hard time talking about gay marriage. They don't talk about abortion that much. Uh, and the war on women issue is, is basically a way that the Democratic Party can talk about these social issues, particularly abortion, without wading too far into evangelical Christian fighting over theology territory. Yeah, so what happened with that? Um, I mean, do you think, what happened to religion in all of this? Um, because it seems like one thing that has changed that has moved this into Republicans having to move or at least put them more on defense was less less talk on these social issues or cultural issues with religion mm-hmm. so less quoting yeah. God Without a doubt. Uh, or, or saying the Bible says this um, I I'm guessing it just the polling just shows that if you say I mean if you go to the core and you say you know, God says, you know, or say something like, uh, you know, sex should only be for procreation and reproduction. It doesn't pull well with uh, broad swaths of the country that you need now to win elections. My theory on this, as far as what happened with talking about religion in public discourse, is that the -hmm. Bush administration kind of messed it up for everyone. You know, when George W. Bush was president, Mm -hmm. evangelical Christians had an enormous amount of power in American national politics, just were, you know, arguably the most powerful religious group in America. I think, I think without a doubt, when George W. Bush was president, evangelical Christians, I can't think of another religious group that you could count as more powerful. Um, and I think by the Bush, by the end of the Bush administration, George W. Bush was so unpopular with how the Iraq war had gone that evangelical Christians no longer really wanted to hitch their wagon to him. And they didn't really have someone standing up for their priorities. And I think also their brand was really sullied by being so closely associated with George W. Bush. You know, uh, even the evangelical Christian agenda became dominated by questions about 
how we nation build in Iraq, rather than questions of what, how should we teach kids about sex ed. Uh, I think they got to be in charge uh, as much as they could have. Um, evangelical Christians were able to implement a significant amount of their agenda, and by the you know by 2008, we're just burned out. And then you see you know, then candidate Barack Obama come in and run on a platform of unity and bringing people together and supporting faith and you know talk, talking publicly a little bit about faith, but not really talking about religion as something that was going to inform his public policy decisions. And I think, I think it's, I think it's two things. I think it's a combination of evangelical Christians. Well, partially because, you know, his opponents kept saying he was a Muslim. Probably because he's a secret Muslim. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> secret Kenyan Muslims, right? Hard for them to talk about religion. Right. Uh, so I think you have a combination <laughs> of evangelical Christians being burned out and feeling like things hadn't gone the way they wanted them to go, uh, and feeling sort of betrayed by the Bush administration. Um, you have that. And then also you have the fact that Americans are just less religious than they were in 2000. Uh, young evangelical Christians in, in enormous numbers stop being evangelical, or they stop going to church, or they stop identifying as evangelical. They're less likely to have their evangelical Christian faith influence how they vote. Um, and you just religious participation in the United States has largely flatlined or gone down. You look at mainline Protestant churches, which, which don't really count here because they tend to be much more liberal politically, but their attendance numbers have just been gutted. Even the evangelical church isn't seeing the growth and expansion that it was. And the Catholic church, which has been okay over the last eight years, has only been able to keep its attendance numbers relatively stable because of immigration and because so many immigrants coming to the United States are Roman Catholic and from Roman Catholic and from countries that are predominantly oh, Roman Catholic. Oh ho! Now the culture wars are getting trickier. Uh, so I think that's that's the sense that I get. I think uh, by the time the, George, the Bush administration was done, the evangelical Christian brand had really taken a walloping and voters were no longer moved. And then also there were just fewer evangelical Christians and they were less excited about door knocking and calling their friends and registering people to vote at church and things like that. That's my sense. So let me ask you something though. I mean, I, I just, on this topic, I, I'm incredibly jaded and like right now, what does it matter if Democrats are winning the culture war? That doesn't seem to be moving the polls in their direction. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem, I mean, we still have a, a, a conservative leaning Supreme Court uh, that whose chief justice uh, probably, I mean, you, 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 I am not TPM's Supreme Court correspondent. We literally have another reporter who does that, who was on the show last time. Um, but it doesn't seem like Roberts, I mean, Roberts probably, there's part, probably a part of him who's like, well, I kind of helped you know, the left last time, I got to do, you know, or he's motivated, he might feel some guilt or something for going along with that position. And I don't really know. But my point is, uh, it doesn't seem like it really matters mm -hmm. very much if uh, the culture wars are moving. I don't, I mean... I disagree. Um, I Really? Well, yeah. Because the culture wars are really all the Democrats have going for them right now. Public confidence in Democrats' right. ability to govern in terms of foreign policy and in terms of economic policy is really low. Republicans, and in terms of health care, too. Republicans win in the polls, or in many polls, on those issues. Those are things Republicans feel very confident talking about. I interviewed Ryan Priebus back in February or March about how he thought the election campaigns were going to go. And he said, the only thing you're going to hear about is Obamacare. If you ask me what my coffee, I'm going to say Obamacare. If you ask me what day of the week it is, I'm going to say Obamacare. The Republicans were chomping at the bit to talk about health care. Chomping at the bit to talk about jobs. Chomping at the bit to talk about energy. Chomping at the bit to talk about growth. Because Democrats don't have a huge amount to run on. You know, regardless of whose fault it is, the last eight years or, or the last uh, five years, five, six years, have not been the best. And Americans have a sense that, that economically things aren't going great. Democrats can't say, look at what a good job we've done at the economy. Look how great things have been for the last five years. Keep us in charge. That's not an argument they can make very compellingly just based on what's happened. Mm -hmm. However, they can argue, do you care about abortion access? Do you want the rest of the United States to look like Texas? They can argue, 
do you support gay marriage? Do you think that your gay friends should be able to get married? Uh, they can talk about those things. And when it comes to public opinion polls, they win on those issues. Not not necessarily abortion, but especially gay marriage. Um, right. And then also, not only are those issues that, or especially, especially gay marriage, that they win on in public opinion polls, or at least for them much more competitive, but they're also issues that get people to turn out to vote. Uh, you look at Emily's List and the amount of money that Emily's List pours into campaigns supporting pro-choice women. You look at how incredibly mobilized gay rights activists are and how effective they are at getting people to turn out to vote. It's the fact that that's a very important issue to a significant number of Americans, especially to young Americans who are less likely to turn out in the midterms. And I think this culture war stuff, if Democrats are winning it, is kind of the only Trump card that they have because there's not right. a huge well, amount of other I issues... Mean- that they can talk about in, in 30 second campaign commercials. So, right. Okay. So I want to quibble with one point on okay. this, but I, I want to give you for the most part, I, 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 but I want to quibble on this one point, which is something that Democrats love to do in sort of like, you know, they love to pull out their calculators, stretch their suspenders, uh, you know, adjust their triple thick glasses <laughs> and then go into this argument right here, which is that they like to say, and I actually, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on this point. Um, that the Obamacare brand itself may not be good, but you you can see Democrats in incredibly tight races like Mark Pryor, uh, like Kay Hagan. Well, not so much Kay Hagan. Kay Hagan has actually Kay Hagan has been running on the social issues, mm-hmm. and she's been running on abortion and minimum wage stuff, mm-hmm. and she's been leading. Uh, so there there's a point there. But um, Pryor is a good example of for most of the race he's stayed above the fray, or at least he's still in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think in the last week it's flipped the, the, you know, the forecasters have flipped it slightly to Tom Cotton, the Republican nominee there, but you know, it could easily flip back on the aspects of Obamacare. Mm-hmm. So not saying Obamacare, yeah. but saying Social Security and Medicare right. and Medicaid. Um, but it is hard, yeah. <laughs> right, but it is, it is hard uh, to condense that to a 30 second ad uh-huh. and you basically start calling it the same thing that Republicans call it and have effectively uh, used to uh, really hurt Democrats and uh, weaken Democratic chances of retaining the Senate. Yeah. This cycle. I, think that's a, I think that's a really good point. That's a very important point that talking about but, health, that Democrats can talk about health care without killing themselves. I think, I think that's true. And mm-hmm. I think uh, Mark Begich in Alaska ran an ad talking about health care reform. I don't think he said Obamacare, but he talked about the president's health care reform, talked about how he supported it, uh, made the case that it made life better for Alaskans, and the ad seemed to have gone over pretty well. Uh, so that's, I think that's a but fair... But the other thing, I think the other reason why Democrats are talking about uh, these social issues is because they're trying, I mean, the, the other thing, and um, Robert Shapiro wrote, a, like, probably the best... Uh, analysis I've read this cycle for, I think it was the Brookings Institution, um, where he said the the disappointing thing about Democratic primaries right now is that it's all about painting Republicans as extreme. It's not, they don't hit the Republican Party, they hit the Tea Party, the mm-hmm. extremists on the right. Um, and there's nothing on, you, you, you should have these highly contentious Democratic primaries right now where they're talking about the minimum wage and what kind of party they're going to be, or they, you know, how they're going to be on Wall Street. Um, uh, uh, I mean, labor, uh, sort of other issues that, you know, are we sort of this sort of blue dog, big government, uh, we're not going to, we're not super far left party, or are we going to be the, this very labor friendly party going forward? And the sort of, I guess, the vein of Elizabeth Warren, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's been, there's a push among some on the left to start labeling like some candidates as Elizabeth Warren Democrats, mm-hmm. um, but anyway, I, I don't you don't see that too much um, because the the two pronged distract the two pronged approach that Democrats feel is very effective right now are is a social issues like, like you've said and b painting Republicans as extremists. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the move to do, I mean, the move by Gardner, Rob Manis in Louisiana, and uh, Tom Tillis, among others, um, 
Mike McFadden in Minnesota, who's challenging Al Franken, is to nullify that attack mm -hmm. and to say, we are not extremists, we are moderates. And yeah. they're doing that because, I think, um, the more moderate candidates have run away in all these Republican primaries. Tillis, Gardner. Without a doubt, um, yeah. uh, those are the those are not the Monica Webby in Oregon so had a primary challenger or a primary competitor who was endorsed by Rex Santorum, who was very socially conservative. Right. Uh, she cleaned right. his clock. Uh, and Democrats in Iowa love to. I mean, we've talked about this before. Democrats in Iowa love, love, love to uh, call Joni Ernst an extremist, even though it doesn't really hold water. They can, they can, right. I mean, comparatively I, I speaking, she, compared to the Republican primary field, she was, right. I'm confident she was the one they were least right. excited San to Clovis was the Santorum endorsed candidate mm -hmm. there, and then there was Mark Jacobs, no relation to the handbag What's guy. the race oh, in, what's too. the race that David Young won in, I think, maybe Iowa 3? David Young faced, mm -hmm. he was the establishment moderate candidate, faced very conservative opponent. A number of very conservative opponents and pulled it off. You know, you got moderates yeah. winning there. So no, you're totally right. I'm absolutely right that moderate Republicans are having much better luck this time around, which makes it trickier good, for Democrats to use the to... Republicans are are crazy knuckle dragging psychopaths. Right. I don't know how effective it'll be. I mean, I'm still. Oh my god, I almost revealed my personal predictions. So you're never gonna get You can make predictions. Me, I'm 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 I I I I don't know. Do it. I, Do I'm consistently it. I'm the first one to say that my predictions I'm all I'm consistently I make bad predictions. So if I'm my predictions are usually What are your what are your previous so, predictions? What's your track record? Did you think Romney was gonna win? My track record is terrible. <laughs> um I thought McDaniel would win. I thought everybody thought McDaniel would um, win. Um I, I thought Alex Sink would win. I thought um, who? Alex Sink. And, oh, and then yeah, yeah. Also, um, also a fair prediction. Not terrible. You're in good company making right. that one. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think what... I mean, I thought Eric Cantor would win. Well, yeah. I mean, so did <laughs> Eric Cantor and his poster. And literally so every single everyone. sentient BA. <laughs> right. Including Dave uh, Brett. <laughs> You know, I, uh, there are, I, there are a bunch of examples. Do you think Republicans are going to take the Senate, Daniel? Is that what you're trying to say here? I think as of today, I, I, I mean, here's my assessment of that right now. I guess you're going to get this out of me. I, I don't know. You know, I don't know. I think, I think the most vulnerable Senate seat or the, the hottest race, I, like, I'm surprised. I think the most interesting races right now are um, I think I think where that that, that that should be taken seriously are Alaska, um, actually New Hampshire, and Iowa. Okay. Um, What's the? I think those are are far closer than you would think. Um, I, you know, I go back and forth in Arkansas mm -hmm. and North Carolina. I think Hagen has been trending pretty well for yeah. a while now. I think North Carolina um, is the least competitive of the red state Democratic races. Right. Um, just because, and, and we talked about this briefly earlier this week, I don't think North Carolina is as red as people want to say. Um, voted for Obama in 2008, has a rapidly growing Hispanic population. I mean, it's it looks a lot like Virginia. It's moving a lot the way that a lot of things are happening in North Carolina that were happening in Virginia 10 years ago and that are happening in Georgia right now. So... We talk about red state Democrats, and I think that's a perfectly fine designation to use for these guys. But, you know, North Carolina is kind of like a purplish lavender red state. So I think I think right. you're I think I think that's right. But but this is a this is a good good time to segue into the hottest state right hottest now. Hottest state right now. Uh, the state is so hot right now. Which is Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> the sunflower state, which you told you told me I didn't know the sunflowers were really Associated with yeah, I feel like any Kansas Republican Party or Kansas Democratic Party, anything you look at, uh, there's pictures of sunflowers. I guess they have right. a, a so large the thing about Kansas, the, the thing about Kansas is that Kansas is weird because the thing about Kansas is that there are two major races there. And the, 
The biggest one right now is the Kansas Senate race, where an independent named Greg Orman, who has been, who you've written about, yeah. uh, who has been both a Republican and a Democrat or, um, in the past, has suddenly arisen to had to seriously threaten Pat Roberts, who had a primary challenger. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, I thought Milton Wolf would at least do far better than he. Did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people um, did. Yeah. Um, so there is that. Um, anyway, so the 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 Democrat in the um, Senate race, Taylor, uh, with basically no money, but polling actually surprisingly strongly given the situation, mm-hmm. deep red te- Texas, dropped out, asked to be taken off the ballot, basically in sort of a kind of deal with Democrats, giving Orman an opening. So and is Orman there, is there, has it been reported that Democrats made a deal with Chad Taylor dropping off, or is that just the assumption? I think, I think, I want to say, um, there, I, I think Democrats have said they have talked with both uh-huh. candidates. Because the Democratic Party um, won't endorse Orman. Right. Well, Davis right. I mean, is that's not going to campaign with Orman. Right, um, but that's the thing. They, uh, so I, I think, I think the, the official interpretation is that they have decided to hedge their bets and move their resources elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah, that's true. It just it just so happened to be doing this in a way that helps uh, a candidate who, you know, if he wins and Republicans... So the deal with Orman is that he said he's going to caucus with whoever is in the majority. <coughs> so mm-hmm. if Republicans win the majority, it's no change, you know? Right. Either Pat Roberts wins or Orman wins. Nothing's really different. If Democrats keep the majority... Uh, then it's a bigger then majority. They pick up a seat. Yeah. Right. Um... So that's where we are. Um, recent polling, if I'm not mistaken, has shown that uh, Orman is a little bit ahead of Pat Roberts. Yeah. Um, PPP did polling a couple right. days ago, I think. So um, before I want to get to the other race in the state, I want to ask you, like, uh, was this... How... Why is this happening? Because Roberts is not considered the most conservative, right? Right. Um, uh, Why is Roberts in trouble? The people that I've talked to explain it this way. So, well, there's there's a number of factors. One reason Roberts is in trouble is because he had this really brutal primary. And he knew about the primary challenger for a long time, and he started taking votes that were more conservative to try to tack to the right so that he'd be more competitive in his primary because he assumed, which was a very safe assumption at the time that he wouldn't have a tough bid in the general election. And one vote that I hear mentioned multiple times is the vote for the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the UNCRPD. Bob Dole, former presidential candidate, former Kansas senator, sort of the big politics guy from Kansas, the the Kansas elder statesman, who's very old, I think he's in his 90s, came to D.C. to lobby for the passage of the U.N. CRPD, was on the floor of Congress, I believe in his wheelchair, talking to talking to senators, trying to get them to vote for it. Um, he spoke with Roberts on the floor. And then as people who watch it, who watch the vote, describe it to me, uh, after he left the floor, after he talked to Roberts, who was one of his political protégés, uh, Roberts voted against ratifying the convention and the convention did not get ratified and Bob Dole was bitterly disappointed uh, and while this wasn't huge national news, not a lot of it didn't get a ton of coverage, people in Kansas, especially Republican leaders in Kansas, former Republican lawmakers saw this happening uh, and didn't think it was pretty. So that's, so that's a, I think a problem for Pat Roberts I think he could have taken that vote uh, he could have voted for ratification, and it would probably have been better for him politically. And that's obviously very cynical to talk about to talk about such an important vote in purely political terms, but whatever. Uh, the, another reason that Pat Roberts set in trouble is he so he tacked to the right, but then as a result of that, he alienated a lot of Republican moderates. And people talk about Kansas like it's a very red state, and it is because it votes red in presidential elections. But it's not as red as, for instance, Alabama or uh, Mississippi or Texas. 
it's the, it's very Republican, but it's very moderate Republican. Remember Jennifer Granholm was the governor of Kansas and worked a lot with Republicans. No, no, no. Uh, Kathleen Kathleen Sebelius. My bad. Jennifer Granholm was, I knew I was getting it messed up. Uh, Michigan. Michigan. Yeah. Kathleen Sebelius was the governor of Kansas and worked well with Republicans there. The Kansas state government and the gover- and the Republicans who governed Kansas were very moderate, very centrist. Um, because you had to be a Republican to win anything in Kansas. You couldn't win as a Democrat. So people who were on the fence would just say, well, obviously I'm going to be a Republican. You know, Bob Dole has an anecdote about saying, which party has the easiest time winning? Republicans? Great. I'm a Republican. Something to that effect. Uh, so Roberts really alienated a lot of these guys. And this election cycle, we're just seeing the moderate Republicans in Kansas rear their head. You know, there's two groups, you know, one group of about 70 former Republican state lawmakers, current and former, who have endorsed Greg Orman. And another group of 100 former Republican lawmakers who, who endorsed Republican uh, Sam Brownback's Democratic challenger. You see these guys saying, right. we will not be ignored, we will not be run over by the Tea Party, we're here, we're not going anywhere, and we want to get rid of these far-right conservative Republicans. So and that's a big problem for Roberts. And part of the reason, so part of the reason, yeah, part, so, and Brownback is a problem for Roberts, too. Brownback's poll numbers are right. abysmal, but, and people who turn up to vote against Brownback are going to vote against Roberts as well. So, so much, so I guess the way to interpret this is that uh, I don't know how to go about this the right way here because so is the way to interpret that that like Kansas is a red state but it's not a super deep red yeah. state. Um, okay, so it's red but it's not blood red. <laughs> okay. Which which brings us to the governor's race yeah. where Governor Sam Brownback, probably the most high profile. I mean, he's the Tea Party governor. Uh, is is lagging in the polls behind Democratic challenger Paul Davis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I'm told, um, and from people I've talked to, and even <laughs> Davis himself, who I interviewed, um, told me that a lot of people give him a first look because they're so turned off with Sam uh, Brownback. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, um, uh, one of the primary reasons that Brownback is in trouble is because he went through with these uh, tax cuts that were very deep and basically hurt Kansas's economy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's given an opening for Democrats there. Um, Davis is the House Minority Leader, um, and he has sort of, he's, he's stre- like, if he could tattoo moderate on his forehead for the duration of the primary, or of the, of the election, <laughs> he would do it. Uh, he he wants to make very clear that he would be sort of a Kansas Democrat. Yeah, totally. Um, and he's like he's like um, the Scott and, Brown of Democrats. Right. It's it's funny because he's I, I I mean I think you can't say as a candidate like a big reason I'm doing well is because they don't like the other <laughs> right exactly but, yeah and <laughs> and you can't win. It's not that. me. It's him. <laughs> like, right. If 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 Davis does win, um, which seems. A serious possibility. Uh, it will be partially because voters in Kansas are so turned off with um, Brownback, right. and Brownback yeah. himself had this no-name primary challenger named uh, Win Jennifer Win. Um, yeah, and she did surprisingly well. Yeah, and had like zero money. With, she had like five yeah. bucks. Yeah. yeah, zero money. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I. So that's, I mean, that's what's happening here. That's why we could see some kind of democratic wave. The rub, the, the more, the drama about this is that um, there's also a very active, very conservative um, secretary of state there, there named Chris Kobach. Kobach, yeah. Um, Kobach, sorry. Um, who has sort of resisted uh, taking T- Gene Taylor, the Democrat, off the ballot, which is what Democrats want. Um, and making it, I mean, that closes the opening for Orman a little Makes bit. Makes it a little harder for Orman, end, yeah. Right. You want two people on the ballot right. if, if you're a Democrat. Right. You don't want Taylor. Because Roberts only has to win Orman. the majority. He does not have to win 51%. Roberts right. can win 34% um, and win. So there's been some back and forth about think, this. Yeah, 34%. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think I, I, I haven't focused too much on... Um, 
this on the Secretary of State race here, but I do know that like it's competitive. There, there's talk of like of Democrats really pushing the Democratic candidate. Oh yeah, there. Uh, um, I spoke with the Democratic and, candidate, Jean. Sh- I think her name is Jean Schodorf, maybe a month or two ago yeah. when I wrote about Brownback. Uh, and it's a competitive race. And again, it's this anti-Brownback, anti-conservative uprising in Kansas. She's really interesting because she used to be a Republican. All right, this is this is this is an interesting part of this whole of this whole situation. Schodorf used to be a Republican state senator. Her parents were Republicans. She was a Republican all her life. Um, and she didn't back all of Brownback's tax cutting reforms. Uh, so Brownback endorsed a Republican primary challenger against her which is unheard of, which also doesn't really happen in Kansas because it's kind of by constitution, a very affable, let's all be pals, let's all get along state. So the fact that Brownback took a very bellicose strategy towards getting his agenda through turned off a lot of people. Um, he endorsed her, her primary challenger. She lost to her primary challenger. And then I think on the day that those primary challengers won or that, that they got inaugurated, I think she changed her party registration to Democrat. And now she's a Democrat and she's running against the incumbent secretary of state. Also, fun fact about Chris Kobach, the secretary of state in Kansas. I think he drafted the Arizona immigration law that was so controversial. Yeah, we've yeah. at TPM, we've covered Kobach for a while. Uh-huh. He's, he's, a, uh, he's definitely one of the most controversial secretaries of state that I can think of. Right. Um, Davis, uh, who does not want to talk about, I mean, when I talked to Davis, he, you know, said, I'm focused on my own race. Mm-hmm. Also, and I very politely yeah. said bullshit. Um, <laughs> and he said, well, you Language. know, Kobach is probably the most, poli- I mean, is a very political figure. Yeah. Um, which is as much of a jab as you will get out of uh, Davis, who's fairly mild-mannered here. Mild-mannered. Um, you know yeah, what? Or, one one thing I, I want to talk I mean, about with you, too. Or go ahead, as far as Davis's personality. I'm interested in that, too. Yeah, so Davis is, he's... He's very, I mean, he's a lawyer by trade. He's uh, the House Minority Leader uh, for Democrats in the State House. He's, 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 a, he's a very straight man. Um, he's very direct. Uh, he is, I guess, he, I mean, th- there is a sort of charm in his blandness in the same way that people write well people i mean there's this this thing this cycle there are a bunch of democratic candidates who are kind of bland there was a great great washington post story about how mark pryor is kind of (laughs) dull and you know the pryor campaign yeah i mean i'm working on a profile of gary peters right now and uh suffice it to say there are more exciting people in american electoral (laughs) politics (laughs) Uh, which, yeah, it's kind of hard to pitch these things and to work, you know, to go to your editor and be like, let's write about this. I want to write an article about a middle-aged white guy who's a lawyer who is running in an election. Or I (laughs) snore. Um, you know, uh, yeah, that is one of the frustrating things. And Davis is one of these guys. But at the same time, it is really exciting to hear, like, one thing he wants to... He has his plan for tax cuts. Education reform is another thing, and reinstituting education funding in the state, which I think is actually important because he, he that's his sort of wonky subject, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it is very much something that I think might be taken as a risk in other states, mm-hmm. or it's kind of ballsy that a Democrat running in Kansas is talking about more spending on schools. Interesting, um, yeah. Although, if you're going to spend more on something... That's a, that's a pretty Yeah, I think easy also, pick. like, education is one of those subjects <laughs> where it's kind of hard to turn that into, like, high-rolling Democrat. Right. You know, education and military spend. spending. We're all Keynesians when it comes right. to those. <laughs> um, so here's a, que- here's a question that yeah. I have for you about Kansas. Um, Davis tweeted yesterday that, tweeted something to the effect of, I was down by a gap, or, or I was leading by two points or something about a month ago. Then uh, Sam Brownback ran a whole bunch of negative ads against me. Now my lead has expanded, essentially making the case mm-hmm. that the negative advertising campaign that, that I think was actually the Republican Governors Association, but negative ads against Paul Davis had actually helped him was what he was implying, um, arguably because they raised his name ID. 
And what I'm curious about from you on this is, what do you think about that? <laughs> uh, do you have thoughts on negative ads it's a hard, backfiring? I mean, it's a hard thing. And actually yeah, helping think... the person that they're hurting. You know, a couple examples come to mind. Dave Bratt, who ran against Eric Cantor and whose profile was boosted by negative ads. When Ted Cruz ran against David Dewhurst for the Republican primary in 2012, Dewhurst ran ads calling him Red Ted and saying he cared more about communist China than America. Well, we all know how that worked out. Uh, do you think oh, that's something that can happen in Kansas? His, oh, yeah. Dewhurst was another another uh, primary that I called wrong. That you called what? Way. That I called wrong. Oh. That I, my prediction <laughs> really? was that he would survive against... Well, it was Patrick, I think, Dan Patrick. Oh, yeah, yeah, Dan um, Patrick. Mm-hmm. So. That was this cycle don't ever, for don't. re-election for lieutenant governor. Yeah. I got that one right. Well, I knew, no. listen, I knew um, Dewhurst anyway, was going to so, lose that. I knew he was going to lose that last summer. I'll send you, I'll send you my, uh, my great National Review piece on how Dewhurst no. sort of uh, screwed the pooch with Wendy Davis filibuster. It's an interesting situation wow. for people who are... Yeah. Super emotionally invested in te- the Texas lieutenant governor's race, of which there are some. Maybe not. Maybe not a ton of people. Maybe not everybody. Maybe it's a small group. Where? Okay. So let me. I mean. Um, so you want to know like what? And yeah, there are a few examples of this. Um, I don't know. I. I. It's a. It's a. It's. I. I definitely think your assessment that that. You know that this is, raises uh, name recognition for the other guy when the other guy is not that well known is an important factor, um, and I guess in this situation it makes it look like uh, Brownback is worried. Mm-hmm. Um, I have I, I remember watching some of Brownback's recent positive spots. Um, so if he's going negative two, that makes him look like he's in complete campaign mode. Um, well, if he's not worried, I think he should be. Right. Um, I, you know, I, or you shouldn't make it, I, I think you shouldn't make it very clear that you're running a campaign. It should be about something bigger. Mm-hmm. You know, it should be about not the campaign, but more work to be done. Right. Four, exactly. You know, four more years and more buildings, more of this, more right. of that. Um, I cut taxes. I'm going to cut I, your taxes more, more money in your paycheck at the end of the month. Etc. That's not, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> um, you know, um, and uh, so I, I, I don't, I, I, I don't know what you want to do if you're, what you want is you want something really incriminating against Davis. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I guess you want something that's not connected to him. There was a bump uh, with an ad with Davis a little while ago. Um, with an actor on the ad. Um, but oh, yeah. I, it turned out that actor yeah. was in, was, wasn't, that actor was like in torture porn or something. It wasn't torture porn, but that actor yeah. was like a sex criminal. I think it was a sex criminal. Yeah. yeah something so like the day was at, so the day was um, campaign pulled it and wah, wah. Yeah. Well, what are you going to yeah. do? <laughs> um, you're going to pull the ad. That's, yeah, that's what you're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I mean, I guess that's that's what needs to happen. Um, I don't know. I think you know Davis. I think if we were to if everything were to stay as they were, but two races that I would predict or not predict, but I think I would not be surprised if uh, Pat Quinn lost in Illinois uh, because he's down in most polls mm-hmm. and Paul Davis won in uh, Kansas. Yeah. Um, which are which is a very interesting because that's what that's what the trends are showing right and now. that's also and just I, a really interesting duo of governor's races because it's hard to think of a state that's bluer than illinois and it's also hard to think mm-hmm. of a state that's redder than kansas at least when we talk very generally about these things and pat quinn mm-hmm. is obviously a died in the wool democrat sam brownback's obviously a died in the wool republican but both of them are you know treading water and the smart yeah. money at this point, almost seems to be on their challengers. So, and also they're both facing challengers who are running as very centrist moderates who can get the state's financial house in order. Kansas, 
potential major financial issues for the state, Illinois, you've got like something like what? Same thing. Enormous pension. It's a uh, huge it's pension problem that nobody can yeah, figure exactly. out. Yeah, exactly. Um, so maybe the, maybe the takeaway here is that it doesn't matter how ideologically correct you are. It doesn't matter what color your state is. If you don't handle finance as well, you're going to be up a creek. Right. It's the economy, stupid. It's, <laughs> yeah, know, exactly. It's the feeling of... Right. It's the, the feeling of people that the economy is doing well. Mm-hmm. Like, if you can make your people rich, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you are fine. <laughs> That's true. what people want right now. They want to They want to be rich again. Well, um, or just stable, you know? They want their or, kids or to be stable. employed stable and Stable would out. be nice, right. They want to know that right. kids with college degrees will get a job in the fields that they studied. Uh, mm-hmm. And those are no longer things that Americans can take for granted. Which, when you think about it, it's kind of crazy. Because that didn't used to be the case. Yeah. Right. For a number of reasons. Um, and I think this is what partially, I mean, this is one of Elizabeth Warren's sticks that is so appealing. Like, paying for college. I don't know about you, Betsy, but, like, the idea of me pay, having kids and paying for their college is probably the most daunting Oh yeah. Uh, task. I Like, I cannot, because I personally would like my, I like to joke that, um, my kids will have many choices about where they go to college. They can go to the art school at the University of Michigan. They can go to the business school at the University of Michigan. <laughs> or they can go to the public policy school at the University of Michigan. So they're, you know, the world is their oyster. But, like, frankly, paying for the University of Michigan, as my parents did, sounds oh, like yeah. an impossible Formidable. task for me. Not to mention, like, right. even thinking about buying a house. Right. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There was, there's this yeah, website, there's this one. Twitter handle, I think it's called something like True Facts, and it's like one of these weird Twitter, bizarro joke accounts, and it'll just tweet weird things like, true fact, sandwiches have bones. Um, but one of the things they tweeted was, true fact, you will never be able to afford a house. And it got like 10,000 oh. retweets. I was like, Ooh. Uh, It's so true. <laughs> but like, that didn't um, used to be the case, you know? Yeah. When our parents I, uh, were finished in college, like, they could buy houses. So, I mean, I don't, you know, I think obviously, about Obviously, that, this is a big just, generalization. Kind of a, um, well, yeah. And in a lot of ways, American I don't know about your parents. My parents were married by now. Yeah. Um, my, I think my mom was 24. Were, my dad was 27 when they got married, I think. Okay. So, your, your, your dad was as old as I am. He huh? said that on... How old were your parents when they got married? Head. Um, they were younger than me, I think. They were, um, I think they were 25 and 26. They had been dating in college and, um, that. And then they, they didn't, they don't have me till like five or six years later. Okay. Um, after my dad finished law school and my mom finished business school. Interesting. So, um, That's cool. a while. But yeah, they, yeah. Um, so let's get back to one thing because I wanted to cover one thing before we go on our sort of general area to talk about something else in politics right now, which is polling. Polling, um, yeah. Right. So polling, we are we are in the point of any election cycle where uh, polling is what everyone, I mean, there are polls always coming out and everyone is paying close right. attention, including the campaigns. Um, and one thing I've noticed this cycle is that every time a promising poll comes out or something for one candidate, the other, can, the other campaign releases an internal poll that shows, guess what, <laughs> that first poll that came out isn't quite true yeah. or something. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> um, and listen, like the best polling websites don't average out polls. They have algorithms that factor in a few things that are magical to me, and I don't understand <laughs> them at all. Um, but it is hard to sort of, I think it, it is hard for um, political consumers at all levels, from casual to obsessed, mm-hmm to really get a good idea of what happen, what's happening in a race when a poll commissioned by a group that supports one candidate uh, comes out in response to another one um, or another candidate. Yeah, um, without a doubt. Uh, I don't, and it's just one of those things that's going to make politics much harder to parse mm-hmm. um, and I think complicate something that was clean and should have stayed tragically clean. Um <laughs> Tragically clean. Uh, yeah. Clean as dry bones. Yeah, I think it's totally yeah. true. Um, and I was talking about this with my editor earlier today, which I'm just talking about the fact that 
at this at this juncture in the history of of our planet of human civilization, uh, we have more access to polls than we've ever had. There are more polls being done by more pollsters, by more publications, by more universities than ever before. It is easier than ever to access these polls. It is easier than ever to access analysis of these polls. It is easier and less expensive than ever to commission these polls. But mm -hmm. we also have information overload and oddly enough, nobody really knows what's going on. So there's there's a right. I there's a the very there's, there's a, less of a sense. Right. There's a great social I mean, commentary is, to be written about sort of this there's poverty. A lot of, of I mean so do you there are a lot of the, the forecasters right now are, are bickering about how close it is. And yeah. I just get the sense that nobody really knows what's going to happen. Um, and we're all looking at a lot of this data, mm -hmm. but it's really hard to tell. Yeah. And I think part, part of the reason we don't know is because um, there are so many polls out that mm -hmm. say so many different things. Do you think the problem is that there are so many polls or that we just aren't as confident as to which ones are right? I mean, so here's... I, I kind of... I I would I think we should ask a pollster on this one. Yeah. Um, and maybe we maybe will. Maybe we soon. will. See. That would be uh, a great idea. But I think, yeah. Um, but I, I get the sense that there are more polls, and it's not some... I mean, to an extent, quality is also uh, a factor, but there are more polls, and there are more polls being commissioned by by as internal polls that campaigns put in the back of their pocket just in case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know. Without and, a doubt. You know, after the David Bratt, Eric Cantor thing, you want to have a pollster polling your race. Yeah. Just, and you want to know, no longer... you want to know if you're 30 points behind your general election. Right. Job just, here. just keep checking. <laughs> that, right? You'd like to be aware. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I agree with you, but I think one caveat to this is that, like, Anytime you have polling data indicating that a, that a race is trending one way and then a candidate comes out with a Me Too poll saying, oh, no, look, things are actually like this, I think you always have to take the internal poll with a grain of salt, um, no matter yeah. what. It's it's an internal poll. And I think because that's yeah, but it's one internal poll that they're releasing. We haven't we, we never see oh, right. all yeah. the internal exactly. polls. Exactly. So we, I mean, we don't even know shows. their internal pollsters tracker. We don't know how it compares right. to other polls. So it's, you know, it's interesting. And look, this is a huge problem for Republicans. Like Republicans polling has been so bad the last couple of cycles that it's cost them races. You look at Virginia, where for the entire Virginia mm -hmm. gubernatorial election in 2013, all you ever heard was Cuccinelli's doing bad. Cuccinelli's doing down. Uh, Cuccinelli's down. New poll shows Cuccinelli trailing McAuliffe by a million percentage points. Cuccinelli basically already lost the election. Cuccinelli right, should just go really home close. and back himself. It was actually a really, really close race. And if, right. and if, and if, and if national know, Republicans had spent more money there, and if they'd known it was close, they'd put up some more TV ads, send some more staff, it's it, totally plausible that Cuccinelli would have won. It, I mean, it seemed like, by the way, that race, it seemed like McAuliffe knew that. Mm. because, And this is one of the things I was wondering about throughout the race. Mm -hmm. I, right up to, until the end, I was, I was sort of like, why is McCall's campaign still acting like it's close? Why are they still saying it's close? Mm -hmm. Why are they rolling out, like, why is Bill Clinton coming out of here? Like, what? Wh why, why do they need that? Uh, because their pollsters and the guys I talked to after uh, the race was over said, yeah, we kind of knew it was, we were always leading by single digits. Yeah. It wasn't a million points down. And we, our, our polls always said that. Mm. Um, so... You know, that, that's what always confused me. Yeah, that's and, interesting. And I think I think you're right. Um, I mean, the big... Cuccinelli's... If, you, if you're a Republican pollster right now, and you can poll races correct, and you pull a lot of races correctly, you should be making so much money. Because there's mm -hmm. an enormous demand for Republican pollsters who work with Republican candidates, who are ideologically simpatico with them, and who can tell them what the heck is happening in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean that, but they have to. They have to grip ideal, ideological. Yeah, and you know, I, I talked about this with a friend of mine who's a pollster for a while about why campaigns want to hire pollsters that are are in the same ideological tent as them. Um, and mm -hmm. he's you know from a firm that's fairly ideological and works with ideological candidates. And 
And we talked about it, and he sort of made the case, and I didn't totally understand it. Um, but I think, I think there's always concerns. Oh, you know, what if, what if the pollster is sneaking in push pulling questions, or what if we can't trust this guy, or what if he really doesn't really really want us to win? Um, I guess for the same or reason, or he doesn't want them, doesn't want the candidate to push X issue. Yeah, I, I guess for the same reason down. that like you hire campaign staff and consultants who are in the same ideological boat as you. You don't want to hire someone who's a total mercenary, even though that might get you better results. Sometimes those mercenaries are pretty damn good. Okay. Yeah. Eric Prince is in town. Um, okay, we gotta we gotta we gotta go to our last topic, which I'm actually really interested to hear what you've got to say. The eye watch. <laughs> go and but before that, I carry around on a daily basis. I have an iPod Classic uh-huh. somewhere around here. Um, which I can't find right now, which is not good, which is actually frightening me a great deal. Um, uh, and they just discontinued that, and the iPhone. And right now, uh, they're going to roll out the iWatch, uh, which is apparently the new magical device. Um, it can do a bunch of things like that Fitbit can do, like measure your heart rate and keep yeah. that through the day, apparently. Fitbit, how um, many steps are you walking? Kevin, Kevin Roos at New York Magazine, who is my go-to source for tech analysis, um, basically said um, that, you know, one of the... Re- uh, um, this is... The feeling is that this is going to be the next thing, the next Apple product, and it's unclear, you know, what, if that's going to hinge with the market. But, you know, the other devices have sort of petered out. We know everyone's going to have one iPad or one iPhone mm-hmm. and one tablet device and one computer, yeah. but the i the iWatch is the next frontier. Um, well, I have to preface this what, by are saying you buy an I, uh, I have to preface this by saying two things. First, it's not actually called an iWatch. I think this is the first app. Really? Yeah, I just googled it. I think this is it's called the Apple Watch. I think this is the first oh. Apple product ever. That hasn't had an eye at the beginning. So well, in a long time. maybe ever. Like I mean, besides like the no, the Macintosh. Air, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but besides, you know, iPhones, iPads, all that stuff. It's just called the Apple Watch, and I saw tweets about a think piece making the case that wow, what a big departure for Apple. So that's my first thing. My second thing is I literally have read no articles about the Apple Watch. I know basically nothing about it. I am totally tech illiterate. I know how to use the Twitter machine. I know how to use my iPhone. And I don't really know anything else. So I'm a low information consumer or a low information potential consumer of the Apple Watch. Um, I'm not a person who reads Gizmodo. I do not have a favorite tech journalist. I really should. This isn't something I'm proud of. I aspire to be a high information tech consumer, but I'm not. Um, so prefacing it by saying that I would, you know, still be using handwritten mail to request interviews if that was, if that was convenient. I would never wear an Apple Watch. That's the dorkiest thing in the world. What are people even talking Betsy, about? You're saying no something is dorky. No way. Never. Not going to happen. It's so dorky. Why would you, and why would you not this, wear an Apple Watch? Why? Why would you? My phone is in my bag. I spend enough time looking at my phone as is. I don't need my phone like clamped onto my body, constantly giving me information. Um, I'm trying to use my phone less. First, second, it's. I mean, it's Dick Tracy, right? What am I gonna do? Oh, hi, this is Betsy Woodruff. Phone call. No, I don't want to do that. I'm not gonna like talking to my wrist. What is even the upside of this thing? I just. No, it's like it's like the app. It's like the Google Glass. Like, yeah, I'm going to walk around in my Google Glass and my iWatch, you know, never having friends for the rest of my life. No. <laughs> what about you? Are you going yeah, to you gonna wear an Google iWatch? Google Glass did. Or, or an Apple Watch? What, am I going to wear an iWatch? Cool. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, so, I, okay. I, I should not be wearing, I should not own any more electronic <laughs> devices. So what, what does I the Apple Watch do? Is this basically like a really expensive pedometer? I, I guess. I mean, it's supposed to be the next, the next platform and... Uh, does it does it tell you information to, on the screen? Like, is it if you get a yes, tweet? It tells you if you get a tweet, does your watch right. light up? That sounds like a horrible idea. I would lose my mind. I would immediately contract ADD. Just a disaster. I you know I'm with you on the one, on one thing. There was this joke in um in I think uh, in Forgetting Sarah Marshall where like. 
Paul Rudd's character is like, I, you know, he's this sort of laid back surfer dude, and he's like, I don't wear a watch. <laughs> and the implication is that, oh, he just doesn't care about time. Uh-huh. And then he says quickly, oh, yeah, well, my phone has a clock, and I just keep my phone <laughs> at all times. Yeah. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I'm skeptical, but people still do wear watches and, you know. Yeah, but, but uh, wearing watches is hipster. Thing. It's like typing on a typewriter. I don't have a problem with yeah. wearing watches. I actually thought about getting a watch. I think it could be helpful. To have like a time for keeping. what you ha- it's, on no, what time it it's on your phone. what Save my phone battery. I don't know. Well, I don't have a watch. Um, but you know, you don't have to pull your phone out of your bag. You don't have to light it up to see what time it is. I don't know. Some of them are cute, maybe. <laughs> uh, I have a friend who works at wow. J Crew who has like a really cool. He has a watch that came with like seventeen different bands, and he'll change the bands. And I'm kind of getting watch envy. So, but I'm really lazy and I don't like shopping. So, probably not gonna happen. <laughs> what about you? Are you gonna well, Are you gonna is... get a an Apple Watch so that you can tell if you've walked ten thousand steps in the day and if you're if you are getting heart disease? Well, I'm. Uh, I should probably. Uh, I should be walking more. Yeah, me too. I, I can tell you that. I sit too much. Totally. Um, but I am not going to get an Apple Watch. I think it's going to flop. But I also said the iPod would flop. Um, <laughs> And I love my iPod Classic. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. I, yeah. Oh, this, uh, that. Yeah, I can't, you can't separate me from that <laughs> thing. Do um, they still make them? And it's all. Do what? they still make them? No, they don't. I've had my iPod, my iPod Classic has been with me for like six years wow. or something since I replaced it from the last version. Yeah. And it has uh, survived with me through good times and bad, and it just keeps going. Nice. For the most Aww. part. Yeah, um, so I'm skeptical that it'll even work. Um, I don't know why people have watches. They're not the cool I mean, either. Dad. The Apple. I'm looking at. I'm looking at an Apple Watch on Google right now. I googled Apple Watch, which is makes this the most significant time investment that I've put into Apple watches. Um, they're not even cool looking. They're like, oh, they're really big and clunky. Some of them have these see-through wristbands that just look weird. Um, no, I don't think it's cool at all. I think I think I well, think they're, I think these are totally bizarro. And I'll tell you I'll tell you what, Betsy. Okay. I okay. predict that House Republicans will retain control of the House, and if they Ooh. don't, I will buy you an uh, an Apple Watch. There it is. There it is. <laughs> and I don't, I don't. You can't break it. You can give it to me. I will buy. I will take the Apple Watch after that. But that that is my not prediction, but. Bet my wager, my sticking. That's my, a good wager. You know, I don't know what we'll do, and maybe we'll be uh, wrong. Maybe it'll be super useful. I need to think of a wager to bet you an Apple Watch on. I don't have one on the top of my head, but I'll think of one. Interesting. Uh, okay, so here's here's my closing argument for Apple Watches being the worst. My closing argument is yeah. based on my personal first hand experience as an iPhone owner. I spend way too much time on my phone. Way too much time. I think it's bad for you. I think it's bad for you to like always have your eyes looking at this very small screen of rapidly moving light. I think it makes. I think it makes you. I think it shortens attention spans. I think it makes it harder to concentrate. I think it makes it harder to focus on one thing for an extended period of time. I'm constantly telling myself that I'm just going to turn off my iPhone for a day, and I can't. Today, I left my iPhone at home, and I was sitting on the train on the metro, and like had to run off and run back to get my phone. I don't. I don't want to watch. I don't want to make that problem worse. No, not doing it. <laughs> Terrible idea. Uh, Western society, Western this. civilization has too many threats as is. We're facing the threat of ISIS. We're facing the existential threat of Ebola. Uh, we're facing the existential threat of ISIS terrorists with Ebola coming across the border. The last, the last extra threat we need to deal with is Apple watches. Things are these are dark days. I think I think Apple Watches will just make them darker. Apple Watches are the bane of our they are the new Obama. <laughs> I think in the next cycle we will see some one party raging against Apple Watches and you know, uh, apply to them and that's why the economy is bad and that's why everything is terrible and it's hard to pay for college because of the Apple Are Watch. Apple Watches the new um, bird flu? I just would asking. love just to see a think piece on why that's true. Just asking some questions. Um, Maybe I'll write that. <laughs> <laughs> I you, more power to you if you could do it. Um, uh, I will say my closing comment uh, on 
on this episode is that there's it's definitely you know the the phone break is definitely the new smoking break you don't stop um, at least in my world people don't stop to go out and smoke a cigarette anymore they stop to check their but phone. it's less social um you know at least yeah. smoking breaks can and be a I, and thing. i'm very much guilty of that too. yeah i think that's i think uh perhaps less likely to give us cancer but also uh less likely or more likely for us to end a friendless and alone yeah all right, Betsy. Well, this is, as always, Partner in Crime. This has been good talking with as you. As always, I will talk to you in a couple weeks, maybe less. Yep. Talk All to right. you then. Bye. Bye.